We need to calculate 36 times 17. Okay, so we'll use a calculator. If we don't have a calculator, we can use the well-known long multiplication method. But there's also a method that's made its way down to us from the ancient Egyptians. It was discovered on a papyrus from 2000 BC, and it's truly remarkable. You just need to know how to double a number, which is why it's also called the doubling method, and to add, but hidden within it are several important mathematical properties, so let's take a closer look at it. So let's start by writing down all the powers of 2 that are smaller than 36 under the number 36. So we've got 1, which we double to get 2, and then we double that to get 4, and then 8, 16, and finally 32. Now, under 17, I start from 17 and begin doubling. So I've got 17, then 34, 68, 136, 272, and 544. At this point, I identify the specific powers of 2 that, when added together, make 36. What we've got here is precisely the binary representation of the number 36. In fact, every integer or whole number can be written as the sum of powers of 2. In this case, it's 32 and 4. I then go to the corresponding numbers in the column under 17, which are 68 and 544, and add them together. The answer I get is 612. Let's check if that's correct. Times 17 is exactly 612. Let's see why this method works. What we've written here are precisely the powers of 2. So we've got 2 to the power of 0, 2 to the power of 1, 2 to the power of 2, 2 to the power of 3, 2 to the power of 4, and 2 to the power of 5. And as we said, by choosing 32 and 4, we've actually broken down 36 into powers of 2. So we're calculating 36 times 17, and in 36's place we write 2 to the power of 2. Plus 2 to the power of 5, which are the powers we need, times 17. At this point, essentially applying the distributive property of multiplication, this operation can basically be done as 2 to the power of 2 times 17 plus 2 to the power of 5 times 17. And these two numbers are actually 68, which is 2 to the power of 2 times 17 and 544, which together make 612. Aren't mathematics just so mathematical? The one can't go here because it already appears in this column, and it can't go here because it already appears in this row. So the one must go here. The Sudoku season has officially begun, and while these puzzles may sometimes seem impossible, there are strategies and techniques you can use to solve them. And no, don't worry, knowing these techniques doesn't mean cheating. On the contrary, understanding them will make you reason better and stimulate your brain. Anyway, we're all familiar with Sudoku. It's a 9x9 nine nine grid with 3x3 three three subblocks, and there's one rule and one rule only. You have to insert the numbers 1 to 9 into the grid so that they appear once and only once in every column, every row, and every block. My dear colleague Alessandro Bellalit expressly asked me what the secret is, or better, what the secret to solving it is. In reality, the only mathematical rule, or rule of logic, for solving it is the one we just mentioned. Sometimes applying the rule is really easy, as there are numbers that are obvious. For example, as we saw before with the 1, the only place it could be was here. Or perhaps, for example, we can look at this block. This 8 tells us that the 8 can't be here, it can't be here either, and it can't be here, so in the end we can deduce its position from the other 8s in the grid. Or we can focus on the columns, the rows, or the blocks. For example, in this column, we've got 1, 3, 6, 5, and 9. 2, 8, 7, and 4 are missing, but 2, 8, and 7 are already in this block, so they can't be in this position. Therefore, we can be sure that there's a 4 here. All right, thanks, Mary. We already knew all that. But what is the key strategy you need to employ to solve Sudoku puzzles? You have to note down all the possibilities, and by that I mean all the possible numbers that can go in each cell, based on the rule we mentioned at the beginning, which is that each number can appear only once in each row, column, and block. At this point, we can go ahead and gradually eliminate the possibilities. And how do we do that? For example, if we have a closer look after noting down all the possibilities, it's clear that the only number possible here is a 3. This is a so-called obvious single, meaning that a 3 and only a 3 can go there. But knowing that 3 goes here allows us to eliminate it from these cells as well, so only 6 is left here, and then we can eliminate 6 from the other cells in the block. Now here something very interesting appears, and it's what we call an obvious pair. 
If there are two cells in which only the same specific pair of numbers are possible, then those two numbers have to be in those two cells. Because if the four were here, then we'd cancel it from these two. But nine can't be in both cells, right? So in this situation, we're sure that four and nine will be here. So we can erase three and six because we already know where they are, and four and nine because they'll be here, and we're left with one in the cell. We can also have obvious triples. For example, in this case, we have three, five, and seven as the only numbers possible in these three cells. Also, in this case, it means that these numbers have to go here and nowhere else, because if three were elsewhere, we'd be left with only seven and five in these cells. And how can two numbers be in three cells? It's impossible. Thanks to this information, I can eliminate three. Five and seven as possibilities from the other cells, which means that in this one only eight is left. So I can write it in. I'm also sure that within this row three, five, and seven will definitely be here in the section. So I can eliminate them from these other parts. So, for example, I can remove those possibilities, and here only one, four, and nine, or one and nine remain. Another piece of advice I can give you is to try to use your intuition. For example, if I think that three should go in the cell, if I feel sure it goes there, I can put it in and try to move forward. If I encounter any inconsistencies, it means that my initial assumption was wrong and three doesn't belong there, so I can eliminate it. And it's definitely seven that goes in the cell. In short, thanks to these strategies, I'm sure you'll impress everyone with your prowess under your beach umbrella. Guys, I've discovered this Japanese method for doing multiplications that's super simple. Come and see. I want to multiply 12 by 32. What do I do? I do a nice little drawing. It's one line for the one, two lines for the two, three lines for the three, and two lines for the two. And now what do I do? I count the intersections, dividing the drawing into three parts and starting from the right. There are four here. Here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here we have three. So the result is 384. Shall we check to see if it's correct? Twelve times thirty-two is, in fact, exactly three hundred eighty-four. But Mary, what if there were a two-digit number instead of the eight? Do you mean like twelve? Let's see what happens. If we want to calculate twelve times thirty-four, on the right we've got eight points of intersection, and on the left we have three. In the middle there are ten intersections, so we have the number ten here. And what do we do in this case? We do what we normally do with regular operations, meaning we put down the zero and carry the one, which we add to the three. So we have four zero eight. The result is four hundred and eight. So it's not magic. It's a drawing of a multiplication.